Hi there. Welcome. I am Mother Betty. I'm the rector at St. Matthew's in Fairbanks, and I'm grateful to be joined today by Bishop Latim, the Bishop of Alaska. He's our eighth bishop in his 12th year of being a bishop. We also have with us Jessica Ives. Uh, you won't see her, but she's the one running all the equipment. She's the parish administrator for St. Matthew's. So what we've been doing these, over these last few months is getting together with the bishop and having him just kind of give us some of his wisdom about different things church. And so today we are going to talk about something we hardly ever talk about, except around things like Lent. Um, and that is the rite of reconciliation that is found in our Book of Common Prayer. And it's more commonly known, I think, as confession. And I wonder what you might have to talk to us about confession. You know, it's funny as you said that, Betty. I, 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 um, it just struck me that we don't seem to talk about reconciliation, confession very much. Uh, and yet, it's kind of the whole reason God came in the form of Jesus to reconcile all things, everyone, to each other, uh, and to God in, in Christ. Um, so confession, reconciliation, sort of is at the very heart of what we're all about as Christians. So it, it struck me kind of as interesting that you, uh, you said that. I agree with you. Um, Especially, I think, if we think about everything that we do in terms of relationships, that's right. And that relationships always have a component of conflict, and, and so reconciliation and figuring out how to how to do that, um, both on a personal level and a more corporate level, in terms of bringing the church into it, is important. Yeah, in fact, you 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 kind of made one of my points that I would would want to emphasize when we and whenever we talk about confession and reconciliation, that ultimately it is about relationship and what relationships are like. Um, and so one of the things that, as you said, that we, that we talk about is confession. And of course, as Episcopalians, um, we are quite used to doing a corporate confession during our celebrations on Sunday in the Eucharist, um, where we all say the same, uh, the same form of confession and then we hear the words of absolution from, from the priest or the bishop. Um, but a lot of people aren't aware that in our prayer book, there is, in fact, a, an order, a liturgy, a form of reconciliation of a penitent, um, 447, that is intended for use for, uh, I think, what most people would describe as private confession. And maybe that would even conjure up images of um, people being in a confessional and sliding that door back and saying, forgive me for I have sinned and, and, and all of that. And uh, a lot of people would associate that, I think, with the Roman Catholic Church, because in the Roman Catholic Church, that order of confession is, in fact, recognized as a sacrament um, and, and really is required. Um, for a, a faithful Christian to have done a confession before they would have access to come forward for communion. Now that's old, old school. I, I don't think that's um, it's not as uh, prevalent anymore because I know that in uh, even in Roman Catholic liturgies now there's a form of, co of uh, corporate confession. Um, but we have it, and I think it can be, I, I've used it, I've offered it, as you, as you indicated, uh, I've offered it as a parish priest um, on, uh, on Shrove Tuesday, the, the day before Monday Thursday, or before Mardi Gras. Um, and, uh, you know, um, or no, I'm sorry, let me, let me back that up. I've offered it on Shrove Tuesday, which is the same day as Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras being Fat Tuesday, Shrove Tuesday meaning Shriven Tuesday, and of course those are the days before Ash Wednesday when Lent begins. Never had too much, uh, never been terribly popular, um, and I think it's because we're, uh, we're not really in the practice of doing it, but I think it can be a really helpful uh, spiritual practice for folks. One to of be the differences then is that 
because you mentioned that we do the corporate confess, prayer of confession every Sunday, whenever we have a, most of the time when we have a Eucharistic service, the mm -hmm. confession is involved. But that's not a time when we name specific sins out loud. And is that a major difference, do you think, between that corporate confession and a, a more private? Wouldn't that be right? fun? But when maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you're right. Although it does say in our, um, in our liturgy, when we invite people to confession, uh, that it is a good idea to give a, a, a period of silence for people to maybe think about what, um, what things they've done or left undone uh, that, might, that might be um, barriers to reconciliation or right relationship with God or someone else. Um, but yeah, so we don't, we don't have that opportunity to really get into it. But I think, I think when there is a particularly onerous burden on our heart, something we've done or left undone, or something that really has injured a relationship, um, with someone else, or, or we really feel is holding us back from knowing, um, knowing a full relationship with, with God. You know, if, we're, if, we're, if, we feel like, if you feel like you're hiding from God because of something, I think that's a thing to sort of think through and, and, and find a way to release yourself from that burden. I think that's what one element of what confession, personal confession, can be about. Um, because here's the, here's the, the, the thing, um, God forgives, you know, and, um, God wants us to know God's love. God wants us to not feel as if we have to hide, um, not just from God, but we don't have to hide from one another. Uh, that, that's the whole point, as I said at the, at the outset. God wants us to be in right relationship and in, in healthy relationships and in loving relationships. So if there's a burden that you have, um, I think going to, uh, going to confession can be a very powerful way to talk it out. So there is, as you mentioned, a liturgy in our Book of Common mm -hmm. Prayer for how that can happen. Can it happen outside the liturgy? Sure, because of course any of these gifts that God gives us are um, are not contained within anything we create, mm -hmm. right? Um, the the gift of forgiveness and reconciliation is a gift of God, and so therefore um, it is it is available um, wherever God is. And we know where we know God is not contained in a liturgy, but the liturgy does give us a roadmap, let's say, or it gives us a foundation so that we can enter into it um, with a little, perhaps with a little more comfort or ease. So in seminary, you and I were both taught about confession and taught about um, the confidentiality that surrounds what happens in right. that context. If I went to a lay person, would they also be constrained by that confidentiality? Yeah, absolutely. It says in the prayer book that the the um, the contents of a person's confession, the secrecy or the the confidentiality of that, is a moral absolute, um, which is to say that it's not talked about again outside of the outside of that that moment of confession um, and sharing, and that's really important, right? I mean that's um, that's kind of a, uh, a safe, it, it assures that it's a safe place for someone to really name and, and, and seek a, a relief from their burden. And if a person is sharing that, well, that's not their story to share, A, and, and B, um, it, is a, it is a breach of, our, um, of what we should expect from one another. Um, it's a breach of our baptismal covenant in a way, right? Because we're not respecting the dignity of every human being if we were to share that kind of information. So um, I, I would agree with you that it's a good idea for folks to kind of look that up, look the liturgy up so that they know what to expect. 
Um, and you said it was on page 447? 447. There are two forms, uh, like most of the prayer book. There's a right one and a right two. Uh, they're a little bit different, but um, certainly accessible. Uh, and, you know, normative for that to happen, uh, as we just said, normative for that to happen uh, with, a, well, of course, the, the bishop or a priest. Um, but yes, it is also something that any Christian person can hear another person's confession. Um, so and, one of the things that people will see is that there's a different wording for once the um, sin has been confessed, that there's a declaration of forgiveness or by a lay person or absolution by a clergy person, does one have more power than the other? Well, not really. Um, I say that, but, but my explanation probably might make someone sort of come to the conclusion that there's a more powerful, um, uh, more power behind the, um, the absolution. First of, all, first of all, it's important to reemphasize that the forgiveness that we're talking about is the gift from God. It is God that forgives. It is not the bishop. It is not the priest. It isn't even the other Christian. This gift has been given to the church. And so anyone who is baptized into the body of Christ is a member of the church. So they, you know, so we can we can assure one another of this gift of the church. We can assure that that God forgives us in Christ. I mean, that's that's the great blessing of the gospel, that we are forgiven through Christ. Um, so uh, the declaration of absolution that a member of the clergy offers, uh, of course, we, as through our ordination, through our orders, and, and the, you know, again, the bishop uh, being the symbol of the unity of the church in the diocese and in, in the greater world, we're kind of um, speaking on behalf of the whole church when we, you know, so, so there, so it, it may be if it, if it helps, it's almost like when, when, a, when the bishop's there, there's more people in the room, let's say, um, in, in, some, in some representative way. Um, does that mean that absolution is more powerful? Uh, again, I don't think so. I mean, the, the, again, the forgiveness comes from Christ. Um, but there is the sense that, yeah, this really is the church speaking to me um, and the whole church, um, the, the, the Catholic church, if you will, with the, the little C Catholic, meaning sort of the universal church. Um, in a way, I think the language emphasizes that even when an absolution is given, it's not the it's it's not the absolution is given by the bishop or the priest. It is actually a, a pronouncement of absolution through Christ, and um, and then of course uh, any Christian can can assure somebody they're forgiven in Christ. I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, it's a subtlety, but um, uh, yeah. I think that's helpful. I guess one of my final questions would be: Is there anything that's unforgivable? Anything that we can't go to God with. You know, I have struggled with that question a lot in my in my life because it's a it's a question, I think, on many people's hearts. On one level, um, the, you know, the answer to that question is is glorious when we say no. You know, God, Jesus died for our sins and rose for our reconciliation and new life, and therefore all. All of us, um, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray, and yet we are all offered this this gift of forgiveness in Christ and new life in Christ. And so, therefore, it says, you know, therefore, there really isn't anything that is not forgivable. But Jesus says the one thing that is unforgivable, of course, is to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. I've thought an awful lot about what that means. You know, does that mean if you just take the Lord's name in vain and you point it at the Holy Spirit specifically, is that going to, are you going to end up getting zapped by lightning or something? Um, here's what I've come up with. This is, this is Latim. So, um, 
But it seems to me that the one thing that is unforgivable is not recognizing that you can be forgiven by God. Because if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, I think that really, to me, means that you're saying that the Holy Spirit's power doesn't work for you. And if the Holy Spirit's power, if you say the Holy Spirit's power doesn't work for you, maybe God's free will allows us to sort of just turn our back. If I don't, you know, if I don't want to be forgiven, then okay, that's unforgivable. You know, you're 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 on your own on that. And that works for me in some ways, because I, I, my, my experience with people struggling with forgiveness, my own struggle with forgiveness, is that I think oftentimes the biggest barrier is my own stubbornness. That I want to say, what I've done is unforgivable. You know, I want to put myself in the place of God when I do that, right? It's hubris. It's something. hubris, yeah. exactly. Um, pride, vainglory, hubris. Um, Pride, yeah. <laughs> Isn't it kind of odd that we even have this ability to be so prideful that we don't, you know, oh no, I am beyond forgiveness. Um, and uh, I think, again, I think that's where private confession can be such a wonderful spiritual gift because it can help us break through that, that pridefulness. I think sometimes we just put God in such a small box. Yeah, yeah, and we limit God because of our own language. Yeah, and we and we just you know we we believe we confess that the love of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God is a free gift, but yet we want to put conditions on it so badly, don't we? I mean, we really do, and um, and I think that's that's probably one of our greatest struggles. I think so too. Well, thank you. You're welcome. For Thank being you. Here today, I'm glad that we could talk about this. Is there? Do you have any parting words? How about a blessing? For this? Well, I, I, I will. You know, one parting word that we really, obviously, we're limited somewhat in time, and and I think that's right. But I think maybe for the future, another challenge people have is this idea of forgive and forget, and you know, how do you forgive something? Um, does that just <coughs> is that just make me into a doormat? And I think that brings into play the tension or the dynamic between forgiveness and reconciliation, which is to say that, you know, you could have done something very um, awful that really hurt me. And um, I, can, I can forgive you that trespass, which is to say I can release that energy from binding us together in that negative way. But reconciliation would not look like things remaining the way they were. You know, maybe reconciliation means, you know, that our relationship has to change in a way that's, that's different. Um, for and some, there's work around that. That's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, maybe that's another topic mm -hmm. for a whole other thing. But I think that's really important. A lot of people say we're supposed to forgive and forget and not expect anything different to come out of it. Um, I think we're supposed to forgive and remember. But when I say remember, I don't mean hold it against the person for the rest of time. I think remember in this case is very much in the same way we talk about remembering Christ in the Eucharist. It's to make it new, make it whole, to remember, to bring together um, the relationship in a new and different way. So reform. Reform, change, new life. Um, and so forgiveness, you can forgive somebody who doesn't want to be forgiven by you. And in that case, it's letting go of whatever it is that's the burden um, holding you down, holding you back. But the reconciliation might just be, and I release you to go back into the world and our paths may never cross again, but that's just how it has to be. So, anyways, yes, um, the same with reconciliation, I think, is the same with the blessing. It is actually God that blesses, the Spirit that blesses. Um, and we oftentimes, I think, like to hear the blessing of God more than we like to hear the forgiveness of God. Um, but uh, on behalf of the whole church, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, 
and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. We will be doing this again. So if you get on to the St. Matthew's YouTube channel, you'll be able to find us and hit subscribe. And then if you ding the bell, you will be notified whenever we put something else on. God bless you. Thank you.